Welcome podcast listeners to another edition of my sailing podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We've got yet another bumper two-part edition this month and there's a little surprise in store for you too. It is nearly Christmas after all. Before we get to that, there's a little housekeeping to catch up on, a few things to mention. Firstly, as you may have heard, there's been a slight tweak to our opener this month. A few changes in the audio. Something we've looked at after an email from a fan in Canada. A listener who pointed out that we only had male voices in the dramatic onboard action in the opener to the podcast. And that as there were plenty of professional women sailing boats at a high level, shouldn't we be reflecting this? She was, of course, correct. So we had a think, and with help from the guys at Team SCA, many thanks Phil Williams and Vicky Lowe, we've made a few tweaks to reflect this very good point. So Jocelyn in Canada, many thanks for your input. I hope that adds even more to your enjoyment of the podcast. As I hope you all know, last month's edition was all about the unique solo offshore challenge, the Vendée Globe. If you've not listened to it, maybe make some time to check it out. We're about a month into the race as I sit recording, and what an addition it's been. If you're not following the drama, maybe take a look at the official website. It's exhausting. We talked in the podcast about the brutal attrition rate of the race, which historically sits around the 50% mark. And this edition, well, it's shown no mercy, has it? It was a massive shame to hear of Alex Thompson's retirement 19 days into the race. Alex featured on last month's edition, and with a new boat, he was full of expectation and determination, heading into his fifth edition of the race. This time, though, it wasn't to be. Irreparable rudder damage has put a stop to his campaign. All the very best to Alex as he heads towards Cape Town. And then, in the last few days, some classic Vendée drama, as Kevin Escoffier on PRB sent a scrambled plea for help. As I record this, I've literally just read his account. It sounds terrifying. His boat folded in half at the mast bulkhead while going at 27 knots. Within minutes, he was in his survival suit and abandoning a sinking yacht. If you've spent time at sea, it's a harrowing account, but testament to all the training these guys do. For sure, it saved his life. Race management immediately diverted several other competitors to the scene. Amongst them, of course, the legendary Jean Le Cam. King John, as he's known. In 35 knots of wind and a heaving sea, the pair managed to effect a rescue. And as I speak, Kevin is safely on board Le Cam's boat. If there was anyone in the current fleet you'd want coming to your aid in a situation like that, it's the five-time Vendée veteran Jean Le Cam. I've just seen a video online of the French premier talking to him about the rescue. He's an absolute legend, but it's not an unprecedented procedure. As podcast producer Tim immediately reminded me, Jean Le Cam has himself been rescued in similar circumstances. Three editions back, plucked from the seas of Cape Horn in dramatic fashion after suffering a capsize. His rescuer in that instance, one Vincent Ryu, who was of course back then the skipper of PRB. Well, there's some real symmetry in the story then. But however you look at it, nice work Jean Le Cam. As we record this, he's the toast of the fleet. But the drama doesn't end there. Literally, as we wrap up this edition of the podcast, Sam Davies is limping into Cape Town after a collision at speed has led to severe keel damage. It's a tough race, the Vendée, a fact Sam's so aware of, but it's such disappointing news. Sam's a tough cookie. If the damage was anywhere near repairable, she'd be on it. As we publish this edition, it's not looking good. 
But I'm sure I speak for all our podcast listeners when I say you've got an awful lot to be proud of, Sam Davies. Now, I normally record these intros from somewhere around the promenade in Cowes or back at home, gazing over a yacht filled Solent. But this time around, well, it couldn't be more different. You may have noticed the slightly boxy sound, but this month it's unavoidable. As we all know, times right now for many of us are far from normal. But thankfully, some scheduled events are still on the calendar. So right now, I find myself confined to a hotel room. We're in quarantine in the wonderful city of Auckland, where in just a matter of weeks, we shall finally be seeing some action out on the water from the 36th America's Cup. Look out for it online or on TV. I'll try and post a few details of how and where you can watch the action. But it's great to be here. And once we're out of quarantine, keep an eye on my social media channels as I keep you up to date with all that's going on. So, much to catch up on this month, but we're ready to go. And this month's guest is an absolute treat. I often say I've been trying to get this person or that person on the podcast for months. And of course, it's always genuine. As I always say, there are so many disciplines and so many characters in our sport that it's not hard to put together a pretty long list of potential guests. But this month, well, he was genuinely one of the first names on that long list. And here's why. He's a great storyteller. He's written several books on his exploits. But more than that, he's a genuine pioneer in the sport of sailing. He raced four Whitbread races in the 70s and 80s, which is an impressive feat in itself. But if you want stories from that time, he's the man. He's so much the man that we've even pulled a few strings and we've broken new ground on this edition to do a short interview with one of his former crewmates. Not normal, but no big deal, right? Well, this crewmate from the 1989 Whitbread race was at the time one of the biggest names in what used to be called pop music. He's the front man of a Grammy winning, platinum album selling, Rolling Stone magazine cover adorning, James Bond movie theme tune performing super band of the 1980s. I am of course referring to the one and only Simon Le Bon, front man for Duran Duran, the band that in the mid 80s decided to hire our guest to skipper them through the Whitbread Round the World race. Simon very kindly agreed to join us for a quick chat, so we catch up with Simon a bit later on. But our guest is, of course, the renowned Whitbread skipper, writer, adventurer, the very talented Skip Novak. In part two of the podcast, we talk to Skip about his pioneering polar exploration business, his famous pelagic exploration yachts, and his love of sailing at high latitudes. But in this part one, we talk the Whitbread, back when heading off around the world was a wildly unknown adventure of how the whole Duran Duran escapade came to be, and of how a famous capsize in the Fastnet race, just weeks before the start, nearly ruined the whole thing. It's a compelling listen. I hope you enjoy the time I spent with the legendary Skip Novak. I always loved that voyaging. It was a huge adventure for a 13 and 14 year old. It was an amazing thing to set off, and know you're gonna be sailing to Cape Town, then on to New Zealand, and then on to Rio, and then back to the UK. Well, thanks for joining us, Skip. It's so good to have you on the podcast, and actually here, in person. I wasn't sure that that was going to happen. I mean, I do feel a little bit of a fool, though, having given you directions to find the Royal Ocean Racing Club here in Cowes, where we're recording this today. I later find out that you'd been a member for over 40 years. Anyway, you found your way okay, so a huge welcome back to the Isle of Wight. Thanks very much. This is, for me, it's where it's all be- it all began. Um, 1976 was Cowes, with my relationship to the UK and European sailing, basically. So you're fond of the place. I love it. We're recording this in mid-October, a time when I assumed you'd be for sure in Antarctica with your company, uh, Pelagic Expeditions. 
I can imagine, Skip, it's been a tricky time in the extreme travel world. Have you been able to, to make it work? Well, yeah, we, we have been able to make it work, and simply because I've been at the right place in the right time and had the right connections, uh, i.e. being in Cape Town, because uh, the boat normally goes back to uh, Cape Town for its annual refit in, um, in the southern winter, uh, May, June, July. And a film team came up to me about four or five, well, four months ago, desperate to get to Marion Island in the South Indian Ocean, about 1,200 miles southeast of South Africa, very remote area. And they had to get down there to film some wildlife footage. And I was the only show in town. So we managed to stitch that together during this COVID crisis in South Africa. And the boat is down there now, actually, on a 70-day charter uh, ending end, no, end November. Uh, with this team, and then I've got to go down in April again to myself to pick them up, the remnants of the film team who are being left behind on the island for the whole wildlife season. So I was extremely lucky to pull that off because all of our normal business in uh, South America is dead, dead duck um, in, in the Chilean and the Argentine and Falkland sector. We'll talk a bit more uh, about your three decades in the South a, a little bit later. Skip, you've been high on the podcast wish list for lots of reasons, but really because you've always been a prolific storyteller. You've wanted to share the adventure. And having just reread a couple of your books, I mean, you communicate with, with a real honesty. It's a, good, it's a great ingredient for a compelling podcast. Why have you always wanted to, to share your adventures? Well, I think it was, you know, uh, self-serving in the main. When I first came to the UK in 76, I discovered that I could be sailing for myself on, on meritocracy, on a merit, 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 meritocracy basis, as opposed to my history in the States. I sailed extensively on the Eastern Seaboard and Florida waters, Southern Ocean racing conferences, Bermuda races, Jamaica races, all over the shop. And prior to that, when I was a young lad in Lake Michigan on the Great Lakes, those the American system was and still is extremely Corinthian, uh, more Corinthian than what you'd find here at the time. And back then, you could only go so far in my position as being a, a boat captain for an owner. And there was a very disparaging uh, um, um, name for a boat captain back then that I'm not going to repeat on this podcast, but that was basically it as a young sailor unless you had some connections to, you know, when you were in, a, in the Ivy League school over there and eventually became a boat owner yourself one day where you could actually skipper your own boat. There was, there was no room for maneuver. When I first came to the UK, I sensed that this was a different environment uh, and certainly what was happening in France preceded what was going to happen in the UK in terms of sponsorships and uh, that type of thing. And I was very lucky to land my first around the world race in 77-78 uh, very shortly after I arrived in Cowes in the summer of 76, and I was off and running. It felt, though, like you, from an early age, you understood the relationship between media and profile and storytelling and perhaps how important it was in, in the whole deal. Yeah, I think from early on, I started writing articles. I remember I wrote my first articles for Seahorse magazine on that first around the world race I did in 77. Uh, Anthony Churchill was the editor way back. And I sort of saw the value of getting my name out there in print. And one thing leads to another like this. And, and people say, well, yeah, that guy, you know, he's, he's a navigator. At that time, I was a navigator. And, uh, you know, then you're invited to this regatta, that regatta. And you go up through the ranks and, you know, very early on, I was a bowman back in, in the States. I mean, that was my, and I love that. All the gymnastics of going up to the top of the mast, jumping over the side to put a rubber band on the propeller, on the folding prop. I did all that. But I moved up very quickly to the back of the boat once I arrived in the UK in more of the, you know, the afterguard role and started skippering boats from a very early age. Skip, I grew up in the middle of Scotland. The view from my parents' house was a massive hill, yet I spent a lifetime sailing. You grew up in Chicago, living in the suburbs, sailing on the lake, and yet you've spent a lifetime exploring the world's oceans. Describe that young boy at Chicago Yacht Club. Did he always want to explore? Was he always looking over the horizon? Yeah, you know, I started like most people do. You start off dinghy sailing at the Chicago Yacht Club in Belmont Harbor, um, and uh, we were in 
terrible dinghies called Layman Tens, and then we went into Blue Jays, which is sort of a, minor, a miniature lightning. Uh, this is really before 420s made the scene. By the time 420s arrived, I was sort of out of small boats into cruiser racers. But, you know, there were two, two, two types of sailing. There was round the cans race on the lakefront or going to another port on uh, the Wisconsin or Michigan shore on a, on a weekend race. So you'd sail, race up there on Saturday and have a big party on Saturday night, and then you'd race back on Sunday. And I always loved that voyaging, even 30 miles to Michigan City, Indiana, across the you know, across the bottom of the lake. It was a huge adventure for a 13 and 14 year old. And I think that set the scene for my, my, you know, wish to see the world and travel. And, and I was quite well read in my high school years. I read, you know, I was immersed myself in Conrad, uh, Hemingway, all these authors of writing about faraway exotic places. And I, I wanted to break out of Chicago. I knew I would never stay there from very early on. It says on Wikipedia that you left college with a degree in geography. But I get the sense Skip Novak didn't really get his education in the classroom. How thirsty <laughs> were you to learn the, the sailing trade? Yes, you know, I got my degree in geography, but that was to please my parents at the end of the day. And I thought, it, you know, it must be done somehow. But when I was in, I, I had some false starts in uh, southern Illinois and western Illinois universities, uh, wound up in Tampa, finished in Tampa. But at the same time, I was working for a, a boat yard there called Courtney Ross's uh, Yacht Service, which was the yard to go to where all the Southern Ocean Racing Conference boats went to prep for that January, February six week uh, racing Fest, which was an amazing. You'd start off in Tampa and race to Fort Lauderdale, and then two trips across to the Bahamas and back, and a few course races thrown in. And it was a, a road show of amazing casts of characters. And you know, a lot of these boats were actually run. Boat captains were run by Kiwis, Aussies, South Africans, and Brits. And uh, to be exposed to all this, the repartee and the singing, and and the and they were all clever people. They could all fix things, uh, and you know, every, everybody loved them. And so I became mates with all these guys, and I said, this, this is for me. You know? And so that was my sort of ticket out eventually to, to get back to Europe, was to work the race boat scene, do deliveries, many races that I could, and eventually it brings you to Europe. Yeah, it's a natural course of events. Yeah. You'd found your tribe. Yeah. I mean, how, how did you get really good. What was the landscape like in the 70s? I mean, was it feasible really to forge, to forge out a career in, in ocean racing? Well, I, well, as I said, you could only go up to a certain limit of being a boat captain for an owner who was on the race scene. Uh, and, that, and that was really it. And I sort of did that pretty quickly um, by working in the shipyard. I was given immense responsibility at the age of 21, 22, delivering boats around the Gulf of Mexico and around Florida up the East Coast, you know, a lot of, we used to commission production boats, those plastic pop-out boats in Florida, Morgans and Irwins and all that type of thing. They were terrible boats. And we used to put them together in the shipyard, rig them. And then I used to get the job of delivering around to either Miami or someplace further up the coast. So, you know, somebody, somehow they, they believed in me that I was responsible enough uh, in amongst all the other responsibility, irresponsibility that we perpetrated continually. Uh, to to do that and you know so that's how I sort of started and I, and I navigated with a sextant in those days when you were doing a delivery I was you know well steeped in celestial navigation um, so yeah I was well placed to arrive in Europe as an American expert that, that's what everybody considered to me when I came in cows there was something special about this American who wanted to stay in cows for the winter of 76 77 they said geez you sure you want to hang around here and I said yeah I love it yeah, I mean, we don't, no. get, we don't get many <laughs> foreigners here. <laughs> no, there was no, no. I was the only one. So in 1977, you're off on the Whitbread Round the World race as a navigator on the Swan King's Legend. I mean, you were so young. I mean, looking back, were you, were you excited or just a bit kind of blasé about it all? Uh, no, we were all excited. Uh, I, I managed to get a lot of my sailing mates from the States on the crew. It was a very multinational crew. Um, and the owner, Nick Radcliffe, was sort of a owner in name, but he didn't, you know, he didn't really have the sailing skills, and he was a bit short of cash, so it was an adventure in every sense of the word of getting that boat around the world. But we had you know, a pretty you know, crack crew, um, and we came second. It was my best result, actually. I went downhill from there with all the other races. But, <laughs> but it was you know, an amazing thing to set off 
uh, especially for me from Chicago, and want, you know you're going to be sailing to Cape Town, then on to New Zealand, and then on to Rio, and then back to the UK. It was it was a Conradian experience sailing back up through the Western approaches at the end of that whole thing. I mean, it was really amazing. It was the best one. Yeah. What was the Whitbread really like back then? I mean, give us a sense of just how wild it was. Well, it was. I would say it's quite disorganized in the main of preparation because there were very few boats that were really well funded. The only one I think that I can remember that was well funded was Cornelius Reitschoten on Flyer One, who did win the race. The rest of us were all grappling for, you know, trying to make it all happen in amongst chaos and not enough sea trial time. It's always last minute. Uh, but off you go, you know, confident that you know what you're doing. And you got a good boat. You got a Swan 65. So, we, you know, we weren't worried about the, the boat itself, uh, but what was going to happen in, when we hit the Southern Ocean. And, um, and so and we, we had quite a few mishaps and, you know, as we cut our teeth in the South Indian, so to speak. Yeah. I'm right in saying that it was your first time in the South. Yeah. What did you make of it all? I, I loved it. I mean, I love the challenge. I love cold weather for a start. So this whole thing of sailing in snow squalls and, you know, and eventually you were deep south, you're sailing by icebergs. And that, that didn't phase me. I felt so alive to be able to be doing that and so privileged uh, to be participating and actually, you know, and navigating the boat as well, finding your way through this murk where you, you didn't have sights for, you know, seven, eight days at a stretch and you were DRing and the whole thing. And it was quite a challenge. And, you know, Getting weather was amazing because we to, to get a weather report back then compared to now where you get a grib file like like that, you had to tune into a HF radio station, take a Morse code signal. So you know I learned Morse at Boy Scout Boy Scouts, but I had to relearn it. And then of course we had a tape player to slow it down so you could actually take it. And then those dots and dashes um, translated into lines on a chart that you had to draw a big scale piece of paper isobars, pressure centers, and fronts, and draw a weather map. And of course, by, this took hours, and by the time you did it, the weather had already passed and gone, and you were... <laughs> so it, was, it was amazing stuff. So the weather really was passing us by. We didn't really know what was coming up next. It was totally unknown territory, what was going to hit us. You know, we could have been sailing... Well, catastrophic weather would have been coming up behind us, and we wouldn't have known it till it hit, you know, totally in the dark. Yeah. But we loved it. That was the, that was the standard at the time. It's all anybody ever knew. And so, yeah, that's it. That's, what, that's how we sailed. Were you paid? Was it a, was it a, a professional? No, gig? God, no. Oh, Christ, nobody was paid. In 77, nobody was paid. Um, we, and, you know, we, were, we became great fl- friends with a flyer crew. And uh, I'm not sure if they were paid or not, uh, possibly a few of the guys, but they had everything. You know, they were in hotels. We were sleeping on board. I uh, remember things like Connie reached out and buying bottled water in Rio because they didn't trust the water supply, so they took on tons of bottled water into the tanks. Of course, we had to use the tap water from the key. Uh, things like that, we were underprivileged in that respect, but we became great friends with those guys. And uh, we, we sailed sort of head-to-head around the world with them, you know. And, you know, we, you know if you looked at the, the results today, uh, how they you know, did a Volvo Ocean race, and now it's on points as opposed to aggregate time. You know, the point systems, we were 50-50 at the end of the fourth lake. You know, they beat us twice, and we beat them twice. Well, as you said, you finished yeah. second. I mean, King's <laughs> Legend was, a, it was yeah. a good, solid boat. Yeah. When you look back on that lap of the planet now, what did, what did you learn from it? What were your real takeaways? Uh, one, that I loved the Southern Ocean. And also what set the scene for my expedition life later is that we sailed by a whole bunch of these subantarctic islands because they're right on the track. You know, when you, after you round the Cape of Good Hope, you, you're heading for Marion and the Prince Edward Islands, Crozet's come up next, then Kerrigan Island and all these amazing places. And, you know, not many people know this, but as the navigator, I sort of tweaked the course um, every now and again. So, hey, I think we need to head up 10 only to see these places and come a little bit closer to get a view. Something you wouldn't do today. <laughs> but I'd love to see these mountainous places coming up out of the mist and the fog and blowing like hell. And there was wildlife seals jumping all over the place and penguins. And I thought, God, I got to go there one day. I got to see these places. I got to step on shore. 
Well, for the next edition, in 1981-82, you were promoted to skipper. You had the responsibility of leading Alaska Eagle, the first American entry into the race. By now, it was becoming more professional. Teams were better organised yeah. with bigger budgets. Tell us about your challenge. Well, that one was another... Uh, that's when I, I would say the second of my oddball campaigns... Uh, Alaska Eagle was actually Flyer One that won the race in 77, 78. It was bought by an American uh, in California, sponsored by Alaskan Airways, that was his company, and taken back to Hoisman in Holland, where the boat was built, and Sparkman and Stevens did a redesign of pretty much everything they could uh, to try to enhance the performance of the boat. And what they we changed the keel, we changed the back end of the boat, changed it from a catch to a sloop, um, we cut off the big doghouse in the back, a big aluminum thing. Another story in itself, that one, how we did that. <laughs> and uh, make a long story short, the boat rated four feet higher under the international offshore rule, and I'm convinced it wasn't any faster because we sailed against uh, Zargo, which was a Swan 65 owned by South African Patakutel, and we had a hell of a struggle keeping pace with those guys. There was something fundamentally wrong with what happened with that design. And you can imagine in those days, because they were all, I think that was the biggest fleet we had. I think we had 28 or 30 boats in the 81, 82 race. And it was like a kaleidoscope of different designs. They all looked different and all sorts of characters running around, you know, all sizes and, you know, maxi boats down to, I think, 40 footers. And, and uh, you start the race never having sailed against your competition. There was no sort of trials or pre-events. You wouldn't have a clue how you were going to do until the gun went off. Off you go. By the time you get to the Canaries, you realize you're on a dog. <laughs> and you've got the whole world to go around still, you know. And that's when the really the grit comes in. What do you do? Do you throw in the towel in Cape Town, uh, get disgusted with the whole thing? Or, or, you, do you, ha or you hang in and finish the event because you started it. And that's what we did. We hung in, most of us. We lost a few people along the way, gained a few. Uh, but it was tough going, psychologically very difficult. I mean, the, my hardest one for all the, you know, the, all the wrong reasons, because we, we, you know, the modification was a disaster and the crew weren't really the right crew either in a lot of respects. And as Americans, we, we, we got embarrassed. We got our ass kicked badly for the whole damn thing. And we, we, it, was a, it was not a good experience for me. Of the four I've done, that was probably the least satisfying by a long way. I mean, pretty tough scenario. I mean, yeah. your, first, your first go as a skipper, you, yeah. you're, you're well, lead, leading the whole show. Well, you know, I didn't start out as the skipper. The owner, uh, Neil Burt, started out as the skipper on leg one, and he's a pretty sharp guy. And as, he, as I said, when we got to the Canaries, he knew something was wrong, and the boat just didn't perform, and then we had problems in the crew itself. Two different factions developed, my guys and this other guy's guys. When Neil got to Cape Town, he bailed on the first flight out, and he said, you want to skipper the boat? And I said... Sure, you know, so you take that responsibility because it's offered to you. It's, you know, even though it's a dog, you, you're skippering your own boat. The first time for me, uh, well, I actually skippered a boat in the Parmelia race in 79, going to Western Australia before that. So I did have experience of leading, leading a team. All of a sudden, uh, Duran Duran popped out, you know, out of nowhere. I barely heard of them and wanted to do the round the world race. I got out as the water was sort of pouring in through the hatch, so I was like a salmon trying to, you know, swim upstream. How motivated were you after that to do it again, but, you know, to do it properly? Yeah, you know, every race you do, it gets to be, well, after you do one, it's in your blood. And you want to do another one and you want to get it better, you want to get it right, you want to win, you want to put a team together that's really cohesive and you want to have a good boat that's trialed, that's tested and all the rest of it. And for that you need money and you need a budget. So that's the first order of the game is find a sponsor, find a backer and, you know, and in the frame. And for me it was very difficult to pull that off. In, in those days it was still difficult for me being an American in Europe to go around trying to raise money. So I actually uh, tried to find money in the States, uh, which was totally premature. You know, we sent brochures around to the Fortune 500 companies and tried to, you know, find CEOs who were sailors and came to, came to nil. 
So I was sort of spinning my wheels at the time, and I was heavily involved with Nautor Yachts in Finland uh, with John Irving and Pat Lilly in the Hamble, and I'm delivering boats to make a, to earn a crust, you know, in, the, in amongst all this. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Duran Duran popped out, you know, out of nowhere. I'd barely heard of them. And wanted to do the Round the World race. You know, this rock star says, yeah, I want to go around the world. And, you know, and, and, uh, and then the Nautor guys tried to sell him a Swan 65, such a successful boat with a pedigree, you know, Sayula, King's Legend, and all the rest of it. And uh, we, I got involved. The Nautor guy says, you know, we want to get you involved because, you know, da 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 And so we had a meeting in Paris, uh, I'll never forget it, with Simon and the two managers, Mike and Paul. And Simon was very much in his rock star persona, cavorting around and effing and blinding and this type of thing, you know, and the managers were there with John Irving, and we came to the conclusion over dinner and drinks that, you know, the Swan 65, much to Irv's uh, chagrin, that the Swan 65 was really not the way to go, it had to be a maxi, you know, with Simon's profile. So, and this is January, you know, the, I think just after the time of the boat show. And uh, so, maxi in January to do a round the world race in September coming up. And, well, you know, you're not going to build one, design and build one, so we started looking for old used maxis around and uh, we that's where we found Colt what was Colt cars for Rob James uh, designed by Adrian Thompson built by um, these guys uh, Rob Lipset and cows vision yachts and bought the hull which was sitting in uh, the West Country a sh you know naked hull with no structure in it that's how far they got when Rob was sadly lost at sea you know off his uh, trimaran and uh, bought that thing and you know Shipped it down to uh, Moody's, stuck it in the water, towed it across to cows. And I remember how the name came up. Simon, we were all down below, and Simon came down for this, of course, and we were being towed over to cows. And somebody said, what, you know, what are we going to call this thing? You know, what are we going to name it, Simon? And he sort of like banged on the hull, and the whole hull reverberated like this. He said, let's call it drum. And that's how that happened, you know. So that was the start of that project, you know, and that was a hell of a thing, you know, to put that boat together in the time we had. Uh, and it was a it was a very um, innovative structure, carbon fiber ring frames, never been done before, you know, no metal in there. Uh, and it was, you know, Adrian Thompson was very experimental designer. So we were pushing the pushing the bar there and the time frame and all the rest of it. We had we had a budget, you know, they backed us put it all together, and then, of course, we, as you know, we got up to that famous Fastnet story, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about next. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> I mean, before yeah. that, though, you know, at that time, to put it into context, mm. Duran Duran were number one in the U.S. charts. Simon was on every teenage girl's bedroom wall, including mine. There you go. <laughs> uh, I mean, did you have any idea just how rock and roll it all was? And why did you think he, he wanted to do it? Uh, well, it didn't take long to... Uh, realize, um, you know, sort of being around the rock star um, group that uh, he needed a break. And I think if I'm right to say that at that point, they, uh, Duran Duran had a split and they became Arcadia and Duran Duran and the whole thing was fractured and it was quite stressful. Everybody was, you know, hating each other and all the rest of it. And that's when Simon said, you know, I'd like to go off and do something else in my life. And the moment was right. And so we, we sort of realized that pretty early on. Um, and but we had, you know, we had no idea of, you know, yeah, he didn't sailing skills were, you know, almost nil. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of unknowns how this was going to pan out. But like all these things, especially for me in my life, I, you know, if, if something was a sure bet or there was a more interesting thing to do, uh, which was totally unknown, and anything could happen, I would take the un uncertainty just for, that's, that's me. <laughs> so, so there we were, you know, off and running, yeah. You seem like a man who's, uh, who's always up for a challenge. I mean, mm. there was less than a year to go, wasn't there? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. You eight, know, not much months. time to pull it all together. How last minute was it? I mean, how crazy was that final year? Uh, you know, it wasn't that crazy up until the Fastnet race. Um, you know, we got a good crew together. You know, we had some of the top guys. I mean, Rick Tomlinson, the, the photographer, well, he became famous on, on drum. He was a boat builder turned photographer. Magnus Olsen, of course, who everybody knows in sailing, uh, he was seconded in with Roger Nielsen navigating, who navigated for us in 81-82 on Alaska Eagle. 
and uh, Neil Cheston. I mean, you know, these are top yachties at the time. You know, seamen, good offshore guys. We didn't have any dinghy sailors to speak of. I mean, Lori came with us on the first leg, Lori, Lori Smith. Smith. Yeah. But it was offshore guys. You know, that's that's we could talk about it later, that split between the offshore guys and when the Olympic guys came into the Volvo. So, you know, everything was pretty well done. You know, we had a budget. We were in a good shipyard. We built the boat, got it stuck together. And we, we, were, we were on a roll. We felt good, you know, up until the Fastnet race. Well, as you say, there was six weeks to go till the start of the Whitbread. And, you know, a real chance to do a, a solid race, yeah. the Fastnet race, of course. And Drum was the star attraction. Sailing with the National Treasure. I mean, your fate was now of real general interest. Talk us through what happened. Well, we, off we went um, and... Uh, we had 24 uh, guys on board and went down channel and we were beating around uh, Dodman Point at the time of uh, West Country. And we had trouble, trouble with the rudder earlier in the day. The rudder, top rudder bearing was sort of going adrift. So we were fooling around with that as we were racing still and, you know, playing around. And then we were on the wind, uh, I think with a number three and a couple of reefs. I was down below at the nav shack with Roger. I uh, had a watch on deck, watch down below, sleeping. And it was quite, you know, windy, cool day on the wind with a lot of boats around, luckily. And all of a sudden there was this almighty bang. And your first reaction is rig gone. And then the boat just kept going. You know, it was already healed about, you know, 15 degrees. And it just kept going, going. And Christ. And Phil Wade, I remember he just yelled, get out, everybody out, everybody <laughs> Everybody who was awake rushed for the hatch. And I got out as the water was sort of pouring in through the hatch. So I was like a salmon trying to you know, swim upstream. Um, managed to swim out. And as the, as the boat sort of closed, the deck was coming down on top of me. I sort of grabbed the rail and bang, you know, like a coffin door had shut. And luckily I was outside the boat, not underneath it. And there, you know, everybody was in a hell of a state. There was a whole bunch of guys who got out. Same with, same with me. The guys on deck just rolled over, obviously. And then, of course, all the guys were left behind. There was no time to wake anybody up and, you know, other than shouting, get out, get out. So they all sort of woke up, but they were, you know, in their underwear, in the sleeping bag, as the boat just flipped over. Happened in 20 seconds. So there we were all bobbing around outside there and hanging on and Jesus, you know, that hasn't really, you know, settled in to your head. What the hell happened here? And obviously no keel and, uh, and there's guys down below and one by one we hoisted ourselves up on the deck. Phil Wade got up, I think, first from the rudder end because the rudder was sinking down back end and put a life harness tether over and we hauled ourselves up. So very quickly we were all sitting on the deck. And then realized, you know, how many were up here? Well, we're 18. Where's the other six? You know, still down below. And a couple of guys like Roger, he swam out after the boat, the navigator swam out after the boat was completely upside down. And he swam out through the hatch, through this like tentacles of running rigging. You know, imagine you know, a kilometer of sort of wire and rope sheets hanging down now off the rod in the deck. He managed not to get himself tangled up. So we started shouting down through the through hull to the guys, don't swim out, don't swim out. We knew the boat wasn't going to sink. And the safest place for them was to stay in there because we were already freezing. You know, we were down there, you know, and some guys undressed, some guys did have fall away the gear. We were all like huddling like this. And Simon and the others were still in there. And, well, boats were sailing by. And Magnus Olsen, who hadn't joined the crew, he was on Karat, a Swedish Admiral's Cup boat, and he was literally right next to us. So his eyes must have been out to here. And very quickly, the, the rescue was called out by the other boats in the fleet and people up on the uh, cliffs. We were the, close in shore, had seen the boat go over, and they were, you know, got on their, you know, whatever, radios or phones in those days. Did they even have mobile phones? I'm not sure. Anyway, probably not. <laughs> so, so very quickly after probably a half hour, hel helicopter Sea King came over, and a lifeboat came over at about the same time they started jibbing us off uh, two at a time and dropping us up in the pasture up on the cliffs in a you know cow field up there. So everybody, uh, and at, at the same time, the diver from the Sea King had to swim in and underneath and bring them out one by one. So every, everybody was saved. Now, if that would have happened, you know, six hours later after Land's End, 
going to the rock. I mean, at night, it would have been a different, different outcome. Yeah. You're lucky in many ways. Very lucky. Yeah, lucky to be alive. You know, and then, and then we, <laughs> we all got you know picked up somehow by cars and whatever, and bus to this big fancy hotel. I can't remember the name of it in um, Falmouth. And, you know, given boiler suits to wear and, you know, we were given a meal and then we we're all thinking, you know, now what, you know, hmm. <laughs> you know, John Irving drove up, you know, and the, I mean, the whole thing was just, yeah, it was amazing. And then Simon, of course, by this stage, the media was onto it. So they were at the hotel as well. And I remember Simon having to jump out of a first floor window to get away, you know, because he was being, you know, assaulted by the, by the, by the tabloids. That, you know, within an hour or two, arriving at the hotel. So, yeah, interesting. <laughs> There's that iconic shot, isn't there, Skip, of, of the upturned, keelless hull mm. and, and the crew all, all sitting on it. You know, I wonder, I wonder what you were thinking at that time. You know, everything under the water, either damaged or destroyed, obviously the keel lost, the rig broken. What was going through your head then? Uh, I don't, you know... I'm not sure. I can't really remember what was going through my head, but I, you know, I was just so glad that everybody was had had made it by the time we actually knew everybody. What it was still, we did a head count and all that sort of thing, and we said, yeah, they're all alive. And it was really, you you, you don't look to the future yet, but when we got to the hotel, that's when you first started thinking to yourself, now what are we going to do? I mean, is it still possible to fix this, to salvage the boat? It's still floating out there salvage the boat, bring it in, pump it out, turn it upside down, get it, you know, and you see, you start to th go through your mind the, the methodology of how to get to the start in six weeks. And of course, you sit down with Michael, with Mike, Paul, and Simon, who are backing this thing. And we pretty quickly came to the conclusion, because of Simon's profile and, you know, to save his uh, reputation, and not least of all the rest of us, <laughs> um, we've got to, make, got to have a go. And so they, they agreed to back you know, the, the, with more bucks, more pounds to whatever it took uh, to, to get to the start. So then we went back and started to plan. I mean, the boat, the start was only what, five or six weeks ago. I mean, looking back, how compromised was she? I mean, was it the right decision to, to do that? Uh, I think if you, in today's context, you probably wouldn't have done it. Um, but back in those days, uh, the, you know, we, we, you know, there was so much at stake. We were all used to winging things in our lives and patching things up uh, through our history of yachting. I mean, you know, when things break, you somehow fix it at the time you keep going. This was a, a bit of a major one. But there was a, a method to the madness. Um, you know, we had to replace most things with new, you know, new keel, new rig, sails, electronics, electrics, the whole, sh the whole shebang, build a boat. Um, you know, we had the hull, <laughs> and that was it, you know. And um, so, yeah, we, you know, we, did, we did manage to go to all those different sort of, you know, suppliers and, you know, the whole thing and managed to found an old rig, found an old Maxi rig from Z Zarago 3, which is a Maxi. And uh, it all came together, you know. But down the line, we had other problems uh, with the structure. But, uh, yeah, we were, you know, we were pretty happy to make it, felt pretty good about ourselves when we did start the race that day. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was, it was a great triumph in itself, let alone what was going to happen next, just to be there at the start. You know, it would have been a shame to somehow, you know, throw your leg, legs up in the air and say, well, we just, you know, it's just too dangerous or it's too this or it's too that or whatever. And, but it's only due to, I would say, Simon and, and Mike and Paul, you know, without them, well, you know, it, somebody would have to have a pretty big backbone and big pockets to chuck a lot of money into something like that that was very suspect, I would say. Leg one to Cape Town. You're responsible for the project, the boat, and the men. I mean, the boat was still, as you as you say, not in in great shape. How stressful was that leg for you? Uh, well, it didn't become stressful until the South Atlantic, uh, where we were beating into the Southeast trades, as you did in those days with those sort of boats. You didn't go outside around the high at great speed. You had to take the short cut, you know, into Cape Town, which meant after you got through the doldrums, the southeasterly would fill, and it was a bash, you know, fresh breeze all the way to pretty much the Cape. It was a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, I think there were seven maxis and only two of them arrived in Cape Town without any structural or rig failures. You know, that was uh, Lion New Zealand and, um, and uh, Discador, I guess, at the time. 
the rest of us uh, all had failures. You know, we in our case, we had uh, delamination up in the bow sections, uh, but worse than that was the keel had started to flag. The keel again, you know, you imagine, Christ, and we could see movement in the carbon ring frames and the structure and, and the whole thing, so we backpedaled, obviously, you know, took the, took the pedal, foot off the pedal and just went very slow, very carefully, shored up the bow section with uh, strong backs and braces and all sorts of things like that to hold the hull in place, so we limped into Cape Town in pretty bad shape. And that was really probably psychologically a, a worse blow than the, the keel falling off, I would say, because, you know, Christ, you know, a level of confidence really down now. You know, what is wrong with this boat? Is this thing jinxed? Is it, you know, and the whole thing went through everybody's head. What do we do now again? Well, have another rethink and try to repair it. You know, and we, we weren't alone. You know, we, Code Door was, uh, had, they had delamination. There was a couple of rigs down, Port of Tan and somebody else. So there was a lot of, you know, the whole Maxi fleet was, I remember up near Sturrock Dry Dock, all, it was like a Formula One pit of destruction there. All, everybody in pieces. And we had a, a month to sort that out, you know. In case. <laughs> so, so off we went again. I uh, had a meeting with the owners, with Ron Holland and everybody, the designer, and made a plan to you know, to repair the boat, and we had to take a drastic measure by putting in a steel substructure in situ, welded in situ, into the bottom of the boat, which meant, first of all, clearing out the interior, taking everything out of there, midsection. And then guys from Sen Marine there in Cape Town welded this, you know, extremely heavy, the thing must have weighed about two tons, and something for the keel bolts to then bolt up through into the steel, sandwiching the, the carbon and the Kevlar hull and uh, skin, you know, tie it all together, basically. And of course there was, oh God, you know, now the boat's going to be heavier, now it's this, now it's that. But that was the only way to give the crew, I think, confidence. Yes, it's going to be heavy, performance is going to be uh, down, but it's not going to sink. And that was the only way to get around that one to keep the crew together. I think we lost one crew member in Cape Town, everybody else hung in, yeah, which was a Hell of a thing. I think. I think. I think. I remember Magnus was very good because he. He. You know. He had a. He was doubtful, but he had a good. You know. The spirit of Magnus Olsen was amazing. You know. And he. He really helped me because uh, I was pretty stressed at the time and really wasn't a pleasant person. I would say, uh, for a part of that, and uh, I was stretched to the limit. And Magnus really was the cheerleader, uh, with a crew to say, "Look, I think it's going to be okay, guys." <laughs> so, yeah. So off we went in the Southern Ocean, and, and from that point on, it was great. You know, we raced hard, uh, didn't hold back, and we were all in agreement that, yeah, we're going to be okay. But, you know, as you turn the corner out of Cape Town and you go in the Southern Ocean, you are out there. It's not like going down the Atlantic. Very few places to get help, very few places to go and limp into. But they believed, I mean, yeah, yeah they, the guys believed in you and yeah. what you done. Yeah, I think we believed in ourselves. You know, we had a, had a very good team, strong team. I think that was the big thing for me, and the drum thing was everybody stuck together till the end, uh, the core group, and uh, that was the biggest joy for me, you know, bringing you know, the whole crew back to the UK and the end of the whole story. Well, Simon was busy at the beginning of, of the race, but he raced with you as part of the team in the last two legs. Yeah. You must have attracted a bit of interest in the race village. <laughs> I've seen some of the shots. Oh, yeah. It's incredible. I mean, what are your memories of being caught up in, in the rock and roll world? Oh, no, we, we, we loved it. I mean, the, you know, the crew, uh, you know, all good looking young guys, you know, they, 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 they sort of cashed in on the whole thing, you know, because every time we came in, especially to New Zealand, you know, there was like, you know, uh, every day on the quay was, must have been 50 or 100 young girls teenage girls sitting there with their legs dangling over the key, watching what the crew were doing, waiting for Simon to show up, you know. And, of course, the crew just loved that because they would have a lot of repartee going on with the girls and all the rest of it. And, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had so much fun in New Zealand, you know. And, then of course, being in New Zealand, you know, it was great. And we did a, uh, with Simon, a TV commercial for Sassoon, um, some fashion label up in the Bay of Islands. So we took the boat up there and we had a you know, helicopter shots of Simon up in the rigging. And, I mean, if you look at this, you know, the clips, I mean, it was just... And we were all in fashion gear, you know, posing the crew. I mean, it was marvelous. Yeah, yeah. So we loved it. But I'll never forget one time we, uh, Simon, 
We had to move the boat, that's right, to one key to the other. And all the girls were saying, oh, can we come, can we come? He said, no, 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 no. And uh, we were casting off, and the girls started jumping over the side of the key onto the deck, like lemmings, you know, over a cliff, sort of getting impaled on the stanchions, and, you know, and, and, you know, and off we went with about, I don't know, 10, 12 girls on the boat, you know, to the changing the key. And for them, that was really a big deal, you know. <laughs> so, That's amazing. This, yeah. this middle-aged women in Auckland now dining out on that story. Yes, it's, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, were, what was he like, Simon? I mean, pop star to the brutality of ocean racing. That's, that's quite the leap. It was quite a leap, but you know, he, uh, you know, because when you're a rock star, you have a rock star persona, obviously, uh, like any actor would or anybody in the public domain. And then when you're on your own, uh, you have another one. And with your sailing mates, you have another one still. And, and I think he really appreciated being with his mates. He could really relax, be himself. And, and nobody favored him like a rock star. That was a beauty. You know, he was, you know, he did everything on the boat. You know, he sailed, he steered, he was up on the foredeck, he was washing the dishes. He, you know, he wasn't, um, uh, you know, considered a celebrity once he stepped on board, you know. So, yeah. You finished third. I suspect, though, it felt like you'd won the battle. When you look yeah. back on that edition, how proud are you of, of your leadership and, and the decisions you made? I think the decisions we made, uh, the ones I made at sea were pretty good. Sometimes on shore, I wasn't easy to live with. Um, probably not as mature as I am now on leading a team. Uh, but I mean, overall, I was pretty pleased that we, you know, we all stuck together. And I think the proof in the pudding is that, you know, we've had two reunions of all the crew since then, 205 and 2015, the last one in Monaco. And everybody showed up pretty much, you know, and, uh, and we still communicate. We're still in touch with everybody. I'm still in touch with Simon, with Mike and Paul and all the guys. And Phil Wade and Phil Wade and I built a boat together and, you know, designed by Patrick Banfield, who was also on the crew in Pelagic, you know. So the outcome uh, of the whole drum thing, I think, was incredibly positive for everybody's life, really, you know. Great thing to look back on, yeah. A great thing to look back on, indeed. So much so that we're not going to stop there. One of Skip's drum crewmates, the co-owner of the campaign, of course, was at the time one of the biggest names in global music. Like thousands of teenage bedrooms around the world, his poster took pride of place on this podcaster's bedroom wall. So we thought we'd get in touch with Simon Le Bon to ask firsthand about taking on the Whitbread with Skip Novak. We recorded our session with Simon remotely, and I kicked off by asking him why. Why five years into the unstoppable roller coaster that was Duran Duran's assault on world music, did he decide to buy a yacht and head off around the world on the Whitbread? Oh, well, Shirley, it, it was me and Paul, uh, Paul and Michael Barrow who were the managers of Duran Duran. And um, it was not a popular decision with the rest of the band, I've got to tell you. Um, why? Well, we were down at the Cannes Film Festival, staying on a, on a little um, a, a little stink pot, and, um, or a big stink pot, called the Albacora of Tortola. And um, we were looking, we were sitting there one afternoon, and they had a they had a, a bookshelf, and one of the books on the shelf was the um, was the photo journal of the seventy nine Whitbread, <clears throat> with pictures of of people, you know, off a fox and and people like that, you know, coming down these huge waves with ice in their beards and eyebrows, and we looked at it and we thought, wow, doesn't that look great? It's a long way from Cannes to the Southern yeah. Ocean. Yeah, I mean, we had we. I mean, um, we should have we should have really looked at that picture a bit harder and 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 thought it looks quite. It, it might look quite quite. Um, uh, it might look quite grand, but it also looks quite cold and uncomfortable. Simon, Simon, what was what was Skip like? You know, as a skipper and. And how did he deal with the situation? I mean, it was a, a far cry, wasn't it, from what he was used to crew-wise? Yeah. Um, well, he, no, he had he had quite a few mates on board the boat. Um, and I think, uh, 
and and that was a very important part of it. He had he had a team who he knew he could rely on. He to me he seemed completely unflappable, just calm and 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 very very he he made very quick, um, very sure decisions um, when whenever he needed to. I only saw him get into a into a into a tears once or twice, really. But how did? How did he deal with with you and and the whole rock and roll element of it? Um, he kind of he kind of said, "Look, you might be, you be you might be a rock and roll star, but but you but as far as I'm concerned, you are an owner crew member, and that's it. And you're going to have to do. And if you want to be on the crew on the boat, then you're going to have to do what every other crew member does. You're going to have to to, to adhere to the watch system. You're going to have to do the job. You're going to have to go on the foredeck. You're going to have to make sure you don't fall off the boat. Um, <clears throat> and you're going to have to do your job. And he says, you'll enjoy it that much more for it. And he was right. Before the Whitbread, of course, Simon, there was the, the Fastnet incident. Am I right in thinking that you were down below when all of that kicked off? Yeah. And, and what are your memories of that <clears throat> event? Um, well, I'm, you know, I think we were sailing along on the second day and probably uh, I went down for a little rest in the afternoon. And I remember I was on one, a pipe cot, which was d- directly above the one that Rick Tomlinson was in, the photographer. And um, there's this massive bang and then you know when 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 there's a big bang like that you always expect the boat to stand up because because the pressure comes off but it didn't it kept going over and over and then it turned upside down and suddenly i was underneath and rick was 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 falling on top of me and um he he said keel's gone and he just went scurrying out underneath the sail bag to the to the main companionway um a bunch of guys gathered there um <clears throat> and uh some went and i i looked down into that water and i thought i don't know what it's like up there i'm just going to wait for a bit it was clear that the, the boat wasn't sinking because the water wasn't coming up come, didn't really come past my knees and uh we communicated with the outside of the boat we got um, Pascal. I can't remember his surname. We got Pascal out from from under a sail bag where he was. He was he was right at the back of the boat where the where the storm sails were, the heavy heavy sails, and um, he was he was screaming. He was screaming. He was he was screaming. I'm f- drowning, and then he stopped, and then he starts screaming again. And we realised it's because the water was he was he was getting submerged. So we ran to the back. The five of us that was were left in there, and um, and we pulled the the sails off. Just just, just the, the five of us just lifted, hefted these big heavy sails off him, and um, and and we tore through the um, we tore the ringlets out of the uh, um, the canvas to get to get it open. I think I think Mickey Olson went running towards the front of the boat to get a knife. But by the time he got back, we just pulled this pulled this thing apart and got Pascal out. And um, and then we started talking to them on the outside of the boat. <clears throat> and um, Skip was, you know, he said how many people he got down there, and we told him. And and at first we got it wrong, and we thought we might have somebody missing, and then we did a recount, and we got it right. We got six down there. And that accounted for everybody. And then the diver came. Really, it happened like that. And then we then, you know, there's one bloke on the back of the boat on the on the on, on drum without any trousers on. That's me, because my my long johns came off as I was coming past the uh, the stanchion post of the lifeline. And that's 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 all I'm prepared to tell you right now on that one. <laughs> It, of course, was not only terrifying, it also wasn't great publicity, was it? I mean, it was a real baptism of fire, I guess. I mean, you were in sight of land. 
How close to cancelling the whole thing were you after that capsize? Well, I was um, I was very ready to. I I really actually I I was quite terrified, but but in a way that I didn't realise until later on, um, <clears throat> and I uh, I uh, I think about a week after the the boat went over i got a call from skip and i said oh skip skip i i really don't know if i'm up for it and he said simon england expects and i and i he just and he i thought yeah there's no way i'm going to be able to get out of this um and we did it we 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 put it all back together we did it and i'm bloody glad we did how much of the Whitbread did you do then? I went. I did half of it. I joined in Auckland, which was the beginning of the third leg. I sailed across the, um, the Pacific and uh, went down into icebergs and um, came up, went around Cape Horn and finished that leg in Punta del Este. And I did the last leg coming back from Punta del Este to Portsmouth. Southampton, Portsmouth, can't remember. Where did we finish? Portsmouth. I should know, but <clears throat> I think it, I, I'm pretty... <laughs> you should know. You I were was, there. <laughs> I was there. No, I think we finished in Portsmouth. I mean, what an adventure. Simon, we've had some big names on this podcast. Legends from the offshore world, Vendee Globe winners, Volvo Ocean Race winners, record holders. And they can all be, well, they can all be a bit blasé about big offshore conditions. For you, Simon, you know, on stage in front of thousands and thousands of fans, that was your comfort zone. Uh-huh. Yeah. How did you <clears throat> take to offshore sailing? Um, I I took to it quite well, actually. I, I you know, I like the sea. I, I was on. Um, I was. I was very excited about the whole project. Um, it was. It was a, a very exciting thing to be doing. And um, and I was surrounded by the best sailors in the world, or some of the best sailors in the world. There was one day when we were we'd been surfing <clears throat> for about, I think about twenty four hours, thirty six hours, down these huge waves in the Pacific. Um, you know, a quarter of a mile between peaks, and I don't know, I don't know what distance between peak and trough, <clears throat> but the boat would pick up. And kind of like the wave would come and pick the boat up and then you'd go rushing down the wave and the boat would stand straight up and um, and the bow wave, would the, the spray would come up to the right up to the level of the first spreaders. And um, and, you'd, and you'd watch the um, and the guys on the um, on the grinders would be would be grinding the spinnaker in as hard as they could. And. Um, and you'd watch the speedo on the mast go, you know, go up, go 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. And, if, and, if, and one, we actually saw 32 on that. That was, the, that was our record, 32 knots. Um, and, um, and, then, and then suddenly the boat would slow down and the pressure would come on. And 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 then you just hear ease, 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 and then and there'd be that kind of horrible moment of you're not sure what's going to happen, and then and then then the next wave would pick you up, and you go through the whole thing again. Um, and it, I kind of I went down below decks, and f- when I came off watch, and you could feel the boat was getting more and more unstable, and um, eventually something happened. And um, the boat end up ended up doing we called it a Chinese jibe, and because of the because of the way that the boom had been held out with preventers and and things, we couldn't. We, the boat was on its side, stuck on its side in the water for. I think we were on our side for at least thirty minutes, and the, and tons and tons of water came into the boat was just pouring through the main companionway. And we were walking around in waist deep water while the boat was on its side with a spinnaker wrapped around the prop and trying to free, trying to get the boat upright. And 
it was it was kind of frightening because we were probably we were fifteen hundred two thousand miles from any land mass, but at the same time I just thought. I just thought I had faith in the guys who were who I was working with and everybody did their job. Everybody did what was needed of them. We all kept our kept calm and kept our heads and we got through it. Um and that was a that was a big lesson to me. Just lastly, Simon, you know, how would you how would you summarize your half lap of the planet with Skip Novak? Um well, that, that that's a bit of a difficult question, Shirley. I'm not I'm not sure I can summarise it. Um, I've got a, I've got an anecdote to tell you though. Let me do let me let me finish on that. Um, so, my uh, one of the my co-owners, Paul Barrow, was a, a real gourmet, and he didn't fancy living on um, uh, sort of on on the freeze dried food, so he he managed to smuggle aboard the boat a side of smoked salmon, which at some point was discovered. And Skip absolutely, he was so cross. And they had a huge, huge row on deck. And, um, and, and I remember Paul saying, to, Paul saying to Skip, I suppose if you had your way, we'd be doing this whole race on hardtack. And Skip went, yep, and we'd be better men for it. Skip sounds quite scary, doesn't he? Simon Lebon there wrapping up this edition of the podcast with his recollections of racing around the planet with Skip. What an adventure. To both of them, thank you. It's been a fascinating listen. In part two, Skip talks about how his next Whitbread adventure could not have been more different. Skippering the first ever Soviet entry into the race at a time while back at the crew's home, the nation was unravelling. At times tragic, it's a fascinating account of a very strange campaign. And we of course discuss Skip's love of the poles, of adventures in high latitudes, sailing his exploration yachts Pelagic around the Arctic and Antarctic in search of adventure. I promise it'll make you want to go with him. As ever, please do let me know what you think about our podcast. As you all know, you can find me at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter, just me on Facebook. And please do like, review and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us on. And if you haven't done already, why not tell your friends about us too? You have been listening to the production work of Tim at Vertigo Films. A big thank you to Tim. As discussed in the next edition, Tim's filmed with Skip. He's a big fan. To our friends at Rourke and Cows, where we recorded this edition, many thanks for letting us take over at the drawing room for the morning. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and sail safe, everyone. This is Castle One. Castle One, race off the speaking. speaking. Raps are coming here, tracks are coming. A bit lower and faster here. We're looking at 10-5, 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out.